Amen. Well, amen. Here we go. Well, welcome Facebook Live. Welcome to From Inside Out Ministry, where God wants to change you from the inside out, spirit, soul, and body. We're so glad that you came and joined us tonight. You could have been anywhere. There's a lot of voices out there on live stream and also out there uh, in the cyber world, but we're glad you came and joined us. We're going to get started tonight right in the word because we got a real serious word that we want to get out tonight. I think God wants to speak to your heart. Uh, I've been cooking all morning. First of all, we don't meet on Sundays. We meet on Wednesday. So we want to give a shout out to all the mothers. Mother's Day is Sunday. So I just want to give a shout out to all the wonderful mothers out there. Uh, they are amazing, loving, strong, happy, selfless, and very grateful people. Everybody loves your mom. If you don't love your mom, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Praise God. Something is wrong with you. Matter of fact, that was one of the criteria when I started looking for a wife. If you did not love your mom, you're out of there. <laughs> you know why? You know why I do that? Some self because you know I'm a principal oriented guy. If they don't love their mom, they won't love me loving my mom. <laughs> you know? So that's the way things work. So yeah, you don't. Know, why I get a woman, you're like, you don't need to see your mom all the time because like, you don't love your mom. You know, so I have to make sure it works that way. Praise God. That's just a side note. Happy Mother's Day to all you wonderful mothers out there. Pre, because y'all won't see you Sunday. But praise God. Now, here we go. It's May 6th. Let's get started. It's May 6th. Man, I see so many people posting stuff on Cyber Media, like, just burn 220. Just burn out <laughs> the whole year. They just, they're so done because they need convenience. Uh, but, you know, it goes to Proverbs, what, 1921 says this. Many other plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that always prevails. This is why a lot of people are disappointed. You remember, I, you know, in our congregation, I warned us. I said, guys, I'm telling you, for some reason, God told me to remind you this year, do not do a whole bunch of stuff without going to God and asking God about what do you want me to do this year. And I felt something coming. I just knew it. And I kept putting this up here, even all through January. I'm like, something is not right. And God says, keep it up there. Keep it up there. And I kept showing this slide, showing we're loading and we don't know what's coming. But remember that if you put a lot of plans he says, but do not make plans without God. Keep God in the background of all your plans. We want you to make plans. But we want you to make plans with God in the background. You folks ask God, hey God, this is what I, I want to do, but what is your will for me this year in 2020? You know, so, and that way you can stay in the calm of God. Amen? Now watch this. We still, like I said, coronavirus pandemic, we have to announce it every time because we're still in it. The whole world's are still dealing with this, but we call it a time of growth. And if you're out there learning a lot of other stuff, you probably realize that the pandemic wound up being a pandemic. But we're not going to talk about that tonight. <laughs> Amen. All right. But I do want to address some of the things that this time has happened to most people who has been uh, gearing up. It's called fear versus scare. Fear versus scare. One reason we know how to address fear because in the Bible, God tells us, do not fear. It's a commandment. Do not fear. So we have to make sure that we're not fearful. What's fear? Let's define it real quick. It's a strong, uncontrollable, unpleasant emotion caused by an actual or, most of it, perceived danger. Perceived danger. I mean, the danger that actually happened, but in your mind it has. You perceive that it could happen or might happen. That's what fear does. It's a threat or a threat. Scare is like a minor fright. See somebody walk up, man, you scared of me. You walk up behind him. It's just a minor fret. It comes, then it goes. It don't linger around. It's not constantly looking for more of you to make me scared. Either I got scared or I didn't, or you might get scared again, but something different. But fear is the one that we got to worry about. This is why God says do not fear, because fear is a lingering, longer one than one that makes you sick. As we study here, because we talk about what spirit, the soul, and the body, and we know fear makes you sick. And this is one of the things that most people worry about getting sick, but they don't know about it being in a constant state of fear makes you sick. Blood pressure, you know, just the walls of your cell contract more, all kinds of stuff. And I can go into that. You have to see some of our other videos when we talk about health and fitness, but that's what fear does. It does a lot of stuff with the brain psychologically. I mean, but the living fear, I mean, me and my wife met a lot of people who were like just in fear. I'm talking about COVID, I'm talking about daily level life of fear anyway. COVID is just the icing on the cake. I mean, you got people who are scared of heights so they won't fly. You got people who don't, they don't, won't even drive the highway so they do the side streets. 
You know, if that's just fear. I mean, that, I mean, you you are knocking half your life away by living in fear. You don't get to do the fullness and, and enjoy all the gods. Yes. I don't know if this is a proven fact, but I did see um, a friend of mine who is uh, a believer. She said that. Fear not is mentioned 365 times in the Bible once for each day. Okay. <laughs> That's a good statistic. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't look it up. I don't know. It depends what version, huh, right? <laughs> in the Apple Cloud, 600 times yeah. is mentioned to fear yeah. not, fear not, fear not. Because <laughs> there's help. Lord, Lord, Lord. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. That's an interesting statistic. She says, uh, you know, somebody said 365, but each day of the year. Could be, but we know for sure it's definitely. Hardcore in God's mind says, do not fear even when you walked up on people because it has a lingering fact. And first of all, the biggest thing he was about, like, you need faith every time you deal with me. You need faith every time you come to my presence. You need faith in all to receive from me. So if fear is present, faith is not. Faith is not. You can't have fear and faith in the same setting. C.S. Lewis, everybody knows who C.S. Lewis wrote a lot of books. 1942, he said this. Uh, most people can rec uh, recognize or even relate to this. Satan says, I will cause anxiety, fear, panic. I will shut down businesses, schools, places of worship, sports events, and I will cause economic turmoil. Jesus, and I will use all that for my good. I will bring the family back to the neighborhoods and restore the family unit. I will bring dinner back both to the kitchen table. <laughs> I will help people slow down their lives and appreciate what really matters. That's a very important thing that needs to be going right now. Because we're talking about what you're doing in this big reset during this time. This is one of the things. I will help people to slow down your lives and learn to appreciate what really matters. What really matters. I will teach my children to rely on me and not the world. You know, our ministry is geared for that. Teaching you a whole new system called the kingdom of God that God brought down here on his shoulders. Jesus, he did. And that we don't have to worry about the economical fact. God, economics don't go up and down at all. It's steady. And we can tap into it anytime we want by using our faith. This is why we learn this system uh, that Jesus brought for us. I will teach my children to trust in me and not their money and material resources. Don't trust in God says some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. I'm all today. Some trust in their cars, some trust in their houses or their job. But the, the psalmist says, but I will trust in the Lord, the owner. Don't trust in that stuff. In fact, God will tell you, lay up that stuff away because where thieves can steal your car, burn your house down. We've seen that with Job. That stuff will be gone just like that. And then some people have lost a lot. Some people's stocks are falling. Why? Because they was in love with that stuff. Now I'm saying it happened all the matter. You're not saying they love it, but God's telling you, don't be in love because God can replace anything if you love him. And not those things. I want to take this time out to just thank God because a lot of people out there have suffered. But there's a lot of people who have not been through some of this hardcore stuff as much as the other people. But we need to thank God. You got our opportunity to thank God. Says God, I want to thank you that I have not lacked nothing during this whole pandemic. There's a lot of people who have not lacked anything during this whole pandemic. They need to give God thanks for that. And too busy, they're too busy worried about the inconvenience of the stuff they used to do and not do. And so like, you need to go, what, what, are you lacking for anything? Are you starving? Do you have not enough food? You know, water, shelter. A lot of people have been taking care of during this pandemic. That, that's the mercy of God. You know what I'm saying? So make sure you give God a thanks instead of worrying about all the other stuff that you do, your inconvenience. I know you're going to get your hair done, nail done. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Beautification. Make you feel better. I got you. But make sure you thank God that you... And have, uh, you know, miss some other stuff. Like some people in the third world country don't even have the convenience of us anyway in the pandemic. You know, that's that icing on the cake. I'm, my life is already jacked and we in the whole thing. Praise God. Now, 1 John 5, 19 says this. Let's put some word in it. We know that we are of God. That's us. If you are born again believer, you accept Jesus Christ in your heart, we know that we are with, of God. But watch this. And that the whole world lies in power of the evil one. But Satan is the ruler of this system here, you know, and he don't care about you like that. This system I call what? This system is business, government, arts, entertainment, media, education, family, and religion. This is where we go to work every day. The Psalms call it what? The valley of the shadow of death. 
The reason why he does that, he woke up every day. He, he might have been like have all his needs met. He might have stayed in a nice house, cows in the field back in the day. But he did something that God told us. He says, remember, Satan is the ruler of this world. So the psalmist comes back in his mind and says, Yea, do I walk through the valley of shadow of death. I will fear no evil. No fear. No evil. Because God is with me. Even though God got his children down here on earth. And Satan rules that system that we just named. He says, we don't have to fear because God is with us. God is like, I know. He already told you. I'm going to put you. He says, now you're going to be uh, in the world, but you're not going to be from the world. You're going to be of it. All right? So, but you're going to be the salt and light. I need somebody to go down there because Satan has come over and stole this whole system from Adam. And I need to put people down there to be the light for me and preserve righteousness. Salt. That's what salt does. It preserves things. Well, the salt that we're supposed to be is preserved righteousness. We're supposed to be like, uh-uh. That ain't right. That ain't right at all. We're supposed to raise our voice and say, that's not right. When we see stuff going wrong, we say, no, we, that's the salt of you. And be in the light by walking it out. Not only says it's right that we don't do that, but we are a living example for the people to see down here, you can do it. Because they'll tell you, the reason why I don't want to be light, they'll say, well, I know it's right, but in this dark system, it's hard to do. Yeah, if you try to do it on your own, but God says, I am with you. God says, well, without me, you what? You can't do absolutely nothing. I'm the vine. You are the branches. And he tells you, watch this. I had to meditate on these scriptures. Outside of me, you can't do anything. You know what I didn't notice? I'm thinking, like, I did like everybody else. I went down this dark system and started using my gifts and talents, which you will get rewarded. Because that system right here, they reward you for your time, treasure, and your talent. You will get rewarded for that. But that ain't what God was talking about. He was talking about, I was talking about using the gifts of my gifts, uh, gifts of the Spirit. He was talking about fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, I did that. Loving, kind, gentle, long-suffering, patience. You won't be able to do that without God. And that's what's going to make sure. They're going to agitate you, make you mad. They're going to get in your business. and Because they're trying to make you not be the light, and they want to snap your light out. That's why God says, no, 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 no. Don't go down there and just use your gift that I gave you in birth. I already knew about your gift. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what a vine does. It produces what? Fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Loving, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering, putting up with people, you know, being patient with everybody. You're going to need that down here in order to keep your light shining. Without that, they're like, you just like me. You go to the 9 to 5, you mad at the boss, you know, so you're not, you're not light. Just like the guy told me one time, hey, I feel like the church. When it comes to church, we just like them. Except we get our Sundays off. When I first heard it, it cut me like a knife. I'm like, no. And I thought about it like, he's right. Majority of the people were like that. This is why they wouldn't be in the light. You just, we would call, you just among them. You just among them. Even though you have something great inside of you, even though you have a part in heaven, even though you have a whole different system, if you don't use that system, you are just like them. And this is why we kind of like responded. And tonight, we're going to talk about that. Why do we respond the same way when we got some extra? We got inside of trading information. We have the holy word that actually told us that these days be vigilant. Why? For the days of evil. God says watch. Watch and what? Pray. What you watching for? Days like this. For evil. He says in that evil day. Be ready for that evil day. This is an evil day. People are scared. People are dying uh, um, from sickness. Uh, even though you know people as big as the earth is, you know people gonna die every day anyway. But still, the way it's happened, you know, uh, people are really uh, put scare on here. Now watch this. This system. Well, she said, well, if we're not in this system, where else can we go? Well, we know that God says, I have set you in Ephesians 26. He says, I have set you in heavenly places. In Colossians 1 13, He said, He's rescued us from the kingdom of darkness that would be here. The system that you wake up in every day. He rescued us from that. And he transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, which is called the kingdom of light. You can operate for now. It's a spiritual kingdom. Like Jesus explained about the kingdom. And you need to go watch my video on that. If you don't understand what kingdom it is, you can go back at jimpreacher.com on YouTube and watch that. I got kingdom one and kingdom two. It talks about all the kingdoms. But the kingdom is invisible. But Jesus explained it. He said, you cannot see the kingdom. You can't, you, when you get ready to explain the kingdom, he says, you can't tell nobody, look here, it's right here. No, it's, no, it's over here. He says, you can't barely see it physically, but you would, it would be like the wind. You see the effects of the wind, but you can't see the wind. Well, that's not the tree moving. No, that's the tree moving from the wind, but you can't see the wind. 
I see the leaves. That's the leaves moving from the wind, but you can't see the wind. I can see your hair blowing with the fan right now. You can't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. That is how the kingdom of God operates. The invisible kingdom of God came on Jesus' shoulder when he came down here. And on Isaiah 9 and 6, it says, From unto us, the child is born, and the son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. Most time you hear that scripture during Christmas time. And you really don't understand what they're saying. But what they're saying is he's brought two things. He brought back the presence of God that Adam lost, and he brought the dominion, the kingdom of God. Let them have dominion, Genesis 1 and 26. In the Bible, he says, let them have dominion. They have Melaka, which is the kingdom, a royal rule, because he's a king. Royal rule. Not just a regular government, but a government of a king. That's why we call it a kingdom, a king's domain, a king's rule. Um, it's sad that I went to church for years, and I used to say, Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is king, and I really didn't pay attention to what they really meant. And it had no significance in my life, because I really didn't know where to go. Okay, that's cool. He's the king up there. I call him every once in a while God. Then I got a revelation that he's, he's God the Father, who has a government called the kingdom. And his kingdom of heaven is in heaven. We call it heaven all the time, but it's actually a kingdom of heaven. Why? Because the king's up there. It's the domain of a king in, in heaven. And then he says, but you can operate, you have access to my government. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, just like it is in heaven. I got access to that. And we can use it now, but we don't have to deal with this dark system. So when I go back to work, you send your land people off. No problem. I'm going to ask that from heaven. God's going to tell you, the earth is the Lord. In this verse right here, two worlds. Two worlds. Down here on that dark planet, we just set your sins. Two worlds. World one is the kingdom of God. World two is the kingdom of darkness. Not earth. World. World means system. There's two systems opposing each other on that blue marble we just got you seeing. Two systems. On this blue marble, two systems. Two systems. When you look down here, there's two systems on the earth right now that are warring against each other. This is why he's telling us, you're not warring against each other, flesh and blood. But you're warring against the spiritual system, principalities, drones, dominions. He says, invisible people are doing stuff. They're blinding minds of people. Our job is to help break that. That's why he tells us to pray. When you pray, your prayers go into the spiritual realm, and they are bound. They're doing a lot of uh, work. He said, the prayer of a righteous man, what? They veil it much. Where they're veiling much at? In the spirit realm. And a lot of things happen in the spirit realm instantly, but we don't see it manifest later on in the natural to later on. That's why he says, don't faint and give up. Cast not your confidence of your prayer that you just prayed. And everything that you've been doing is sending in the spiritual realm. Because even when you praise your hands, don't cast it away. He says, praise and worship. For the spirit of heaviness, he's got a spirit of heaviness trying to come on you. Then he's trying to make you feel, talking about suicide and thought. Start praising God. He says, don't cast that. You cast it off. And he, they're gone. It's a spirit behind everybody. That's why we would say the spirit of anger, spirit of murder upon somebody. You know, a murdering spirit has been released in the neighborhood. See, we can go and pray and break that. That's the power and authority that God has gave us. You ain't warning your flesh and blood. You're more concerned about what the murder looks like. They put out a, a, a alert on the phone. You know, they drive a pickup truck. That ain't what you're going to pray against. You're going to pray about that murdering spirit that's out there. And you're going to bring it in because that's what's making the person do it. Most people go, oh, he's just a bad person. What makes him a bad person is the spirit of the bad on him, all right? Put the spirit of good in him, hey, amen? <laughs> Absolutely. But there are two worlds on the blue marble. And God says in Psalms 115 and 16, it says this, The earth, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord. But the earth he has given to the children of man. God says, I don't give you guys the earth. And you're going to have dominion over it. Now, he did it in the beginning with Adam. Adam lost it, gave it to Satan. Then Jesus came back, won them, won it back. and says, now everybody who got my light at me, you can go back and dominate. And everything that I gave Adam is yours. But you have to fight for it. It's called the good fight of faith. You don't use your faith and fight for it. We're doing the spiritual realm. In the Old Testament, they did everything naturally. They fought for every territory they got. Your territory is spiritual. Me and my wife now, we're going walks right now. We're walking through our neighborhood and we're praying. We're praying for people breaking their cars and going to get some stuff like that. Murdering spirits. Praying upon a, a certain house that their marriage and their family be protected. We have the authority to do that. That's our job. That's what God wants to do. Down here being light 
actually operating with the kingdom, releasing the kingdom everywhere you go, your workplace, your play, wherever you want to go, when you go out there, release the kingdom. That's why God says, you don't have no kingdom in the building. The kingdom of God is what? Within you. Why? Because everywhere you go, he says, and when you go, preach this gospel of the kingdom of God. Because we're going to release that. Now tonight we're talking about uh, how do you respond in a reset world? The whole world's been reset. Before this COVID happened, some people had problems anyway, right? We all have problems. We ain't perfect. So we got our own issues, right? For some reason, all of a sudden, just like the cracking jokes in the news about, man, since COVID come, a lot of other diseases got cured. Because ain't nobody talking about it, right? Ain't nobody talking about AIDS. <laughs> nobody talking about, you know, even cancer. Even though people are still sick with cancer and can't even get to the hospital because of that. They're like, don't put you on the back burner. You know, your, your essential surgery and stuff like some of the stuff is not getting taken care of. Some people do, but some states not. No, we don't want you in here. You can't be around. So but the, the, the influenza, nobody reported the numbers on that. All of a sudden, COVID is the cure-all for everything. You know, well, you can take it to the next level. Since the whole world's been reset, some of the small problems you used to have, you kind of forgot about it. You put them on the back burner just like they put us on the back burner, didn't you? You forgot about some of those problems you used to have. What? When you do that, it probably opened up some new ones. <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, because it's, we, it forced us to do some things that we never done before, which is not a bad thing. It's some things that we should have been doing anyway. A lot of people doing a lot of house projects. A lot of people get to keep eyes on their kids. <laughs> they get to see their own kids for once. You know? And they're like, whoa. So I guess the elementary teacher was bad when saying little Johnny was acting like that. <laughs> you know? We, down there screaming at those four teachers. Now y'all need to all, when this thing open up, go give all those teachers gifts, baskets. <laughs> you know, people don't understand how it is, but God gave us up. He says, I'm going to bring the family back because this family extension of a child ring is supposed to be an extension all the way there where they help you and assist you, not raise your kids for you. So it's your job to raise your kid. And God put you in a position. Now you have to see, okay, all right, we got this, some little stuff we need to work out here that I didn't know about. Because we're just rushing and hurting them out the door real quick. And the poor teachers have to deal with it. And you're in shock and awe when they give you a report. Not my kid. You won't be saying that too much. No, not my kid. Yes, your kid. Your loving kid. A gift from heaven, from above. Yes, your kid. It just need to be reared in the fear and reverence of God. And that is your job. Amen? The reset. How do you deal with, deal with the reset? Now? The reset in the world. How do you respond? Well, this is not the first time we had a reset. You know that? Noah's Ark. It was a reset of the whole earth before. See, I, I told you, this is why with believers, if you don't get anywhere, I'm like, look, we have what you call insider trading information. That's what I like to call it. You should know. I mean, we're almost acting like when Jesus came on the scene and he was it was on Nicodemus, you do not know this. And you're a teacher of the word, of the law, back then. And the same thing, he says, how do y'all miss your hour of visitation? When God has set you up, you're the only one that had it. It's not like the Gentiles knew this stuff. The Romans didn't know nothing about this stuff. You guys had the word telling you, here's a road map. For when he show up, this would go like, and they're like, eh, no. <laughs> Look like a duck. <laughs> Act like a duck, but nah, we don't believe it's a duck. You know, that's the way they basically did Jesus. And now we can't do the same thing because this happened before. Whatever God said he's gonna do, he's gonna do it. Here's another reset. Most people look at it way. This, this was a reset for humanity. When Jesus died on the cross, he gave you the reset. This is one of the best things that ever happened. Oh my goodness. Christ on the cross was a reset for all humanity. It gave you a fresh start. That's why God said, what? You're a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. Where can you do that? That's a whole reset. I mean, if you had a crazy life, look at Mary Magdalene. They said she was a prostitute all this stuff in the Bible. Who was it? It had some people like that here now. But you can have a reset. <laughs> Who was it? Like, I wasn't. You got your own thing. <laughs> I wasn't either. It'd be all right now. I'm going to with you. But I had my own thing. You know what I'm saying? And we all got our own thing. And But Jesus on the cross, though. On the cross, he did an opportunity for us to actually have a reset in humanity. This is why we celebrate himself. 
The reason why we don't celebrate as much, because I mean, we I ain't saying we. I'm saying a lot of people don't do it, is because this: you don't meditate and think about it that much. You don't really know what garbage it is. Do you? Oh my goodness! A reset. Anybody, you could be in the worst part of your life, down, you know, in the bottom of the most thing, despaired in your heart, thinking all kind of crazy. And then the spirit of the living God, a broken heart and a contract spirit, I won't turn away. God, if you're really out there and you're really real, do something for me. I know I'm not perfect. And here, quicken your spirit. Just come in your spirit and give you a whole new outlook on life. What's changed? Nothing around you changed, but you did. He took that heart of stone and gave you a heart of flesh. And he did the exchange like he did on his cross right here. Exchange. I'm gonna take their wrath. I'm gonna take their beat. I'm gonna take that pain that God's feeling right now, and I'm, I'm gonna pay. I'm gonna put it on me. And God, as soon as you cry out like that by faith in God, He takes that exchange that He did over two thousand years ago, and He instantly do it to you again. A reset. Oh man, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. A reset. This is why you should love Himself. I mean, that was. I mean, that's awesome. You get a whole new fresh start. And watch Ecclesiastes. Now watch this. But you can read about it. You can read about what he says he's going to do. Watch this. It says, Ecclesiastes 1 9 says, That which has been is what will be. That which is done, watch this, will be done again. And there is nothing new under the sun. I remember as a kid reading that stuff, I'm like, what, what do you mean by that? Nothing new under the sun. You think you all brand new. <laughs> Praise God. But uh, <laughs> we feel like we all brand new. God said, I, I seen one like you before. I can go down four generations and find you. <laughs> you know, I know you think you all in the bag of chip. Oh, you had plenty of you walk around on the planet before. God lives in time. He, I mean, in eternity, he gets to look at time. He didn't see. He says, really? All it is is cycle. Generation, what, 40 years? 40 years. This is why we have to keep preaching this gospel because after 40 years, there's a whole new reset of people who never seen anything. So therefore, they think it is all new. All right? If you don't understand what I just said, right, go and check out what we're going through right now. I never thought that I would see Napa Harold Afros in our culture come back. <laughs> I never thought that I would see vinyl records out selling CDs. I never thought that I would see one day somebody asked me when I was on the mountain hiking, could you take me a picture? And it was a Polaroid camera. I'm like, what? I never thought that you would see the stuff all over here. And here, right here, God's telling you, why not you? Let's read what I told you is going to happen. That which has been will be again, and that which has done will be done again. Not that things going to be, but certain things that has been done we're going to be done all over again. This is why we're supposed to have studied history. You know, and then they start changing history on us, and it's, it's, it's very dangerous for you not to know real history. Why? Because that history is going to show up again. And if you don't know about history, you're going to repeat it. And some of the stuff is not good. We're supposed to study like, hey, we want to you know, eat the meat and uh, spit out the bone in some of the history. You're like, yeah, that's some media stuff we did right. But some of the stuff in bones, we might be get choked on again. We don't want that to happen. So we study history because it's going to happen again. You're not new. I know you think, oh, this is all new. No, in your generation, it might be. Nobody ever done it in probably 40, 50 years, they haven't. But somebody on the planet did, thought the way you did, talked the way you did, all the same stuff. So you can learn from this. God says, because most people try to teach the Bible, even though the Bible has history in it, it's not a history book. Matter of fact, it's a government document. It's a constitution from the kingdom of heaven. It's our covenant. But it's more of a constitution because we live in a government, right? So it has history in it, so you make a history book. And history, you usually get one line. You start at the beginning of the history when they start recording and finally figure out they're going to write stuff down and they just go all the way through to the end and they say, okay, now we're here. But not in the Bible. God's telling you right now, this is how my stuff works. It's centrical. One layer. It's like walking around in a path. I remember in my uh, home back in the day in the country, we used to cut through the yard and cut a path. And my dad said, stop doing that because you're leaving a pathway in the middle of the grass. Walk around. Because he was messing up the terrain of the grass. So you, just, you keep walking that walk, you're going to kill the path. Well, God's terrain is you walk it over and over again. So what we're doing is getting a trench, a word of life. Watch this more so, revelation. So somebody who walked this path before you, as you walked it fast, you're supposed to get what they did in that trench. 
but you also get more revelation. And then you leave it behind for the next group. They get more revelation. And each person gets that revelation that they need in their time. It's so awesome, my God. He don't reveal everything. Everything has not been revealed yet. Why? You don't need it. But God reveals to you, when he reveals to me, hey, you need that. And you need to work with that. Don't you try to go out there and try to grab more than you can have. No, no, God said, I gave you enough to work with. <laughs> so we don't need more. God said, I will open up that veil for people who need to know that veil. Of course, people who seek it out. But people who are seeking it out in harm and thirst are more righteous. God's going to give you revelation. But he's going to give you revelation of something that's already been revealed. All right? And if it's something new, it will be revealed in your time. All right? He said, in my time, it will be revealed. And then the right people have access to it. And the kingdom is all about access. You don't hoard nothing or hold nothing. You're a stewardship. I'm a stewardship, stewardship of the revelation that I have. I'm a stewardship of everything that I own. And God says, you don't own that. That's mine. That's my house, my car, your clothes, even your own breath belongs to me. And when you get ready to leave here, guess where that breath comes going back to? It's going back to God. See, this is why he stuck me. If you are, are in Christ, <laughs> you know, you want to be in Christ when that breath leaves. <laughs> why? Because not, you got nothing to breathe with. <laughs> you know, all this stuff returns. Everything goes back where it came from. The earth suit you borrowed from the earth. You're not bringing it up into heaven. It's going to stay right here. God's system is so, if you just pay attention, you're going to have to slow down, meditate on the word. When you read stuff like Ecclesiastes, and he tells you like, that that which was being, will be again like, wow. And you meditate, and you start saying, then he'll start showing you natural things. As an example, like, you remember? Like, yeah, that's true. We're right back. It's like we call it between what? The, the 70s right now? I think we're in the 70s. You know, as far as how people are, the colors came back. You know, that I never thought, like, wow, Lord, don't let the green shag carpet come back. <laughs> that would be uh, that would be ungodly. No, I'm switching. <laughs> Not the green shag, somebody's going to bring the flowers. <laughs> Praise God. Bell bottoms. You know, all this stuff. Oh, we're going to get some parachute pants going again. People are like, what's the parachute pants? Like, mm -hmm. You'll love them. <laughs> You'll love them. You know, I'm telling you, boy, but full circle. Now watch this. Chapter, uh, verse 15, 3 and 15. Ecclesiastes 3 and 15 says this. What is happening now? Here's another verse. What is happening now has happened before. He's telling you again. And what will happen in the future has happened before. Because God makes the, watch this. This we got me when I pray that. Because God makes the same things happen over and over and over again. In my video, called Back to Your Future, which is on YouTube. I go through all this stuff, and I do a lot of good examples showing you that your future is in your past. Your future is in your past. That's what I call Back to Your Future. If you want to know what humanity's going to do and what you're going to do, all you got to do is go back and look at the previous. And it's the same stuff. God says, there's nothing new underneath the planet. There's nothing new underneath the sun. So I know we be thinking like that's what Satan tricked us and thinking like, oh, this is all new. Nobody did this before. Sure, pal. <laughs> yeah, you run with that. <laughs> See how you like that. Now watch this. Why do some things need to have a reset? Okay, we get it. Some things. Why do some things need to have a reset? Well, let's look at the natural. First off, chaos. Chaos. Most people who want to cause wars and rumors of wars. They need chaos to do it. Mayhem, chaos. You need a reset. I think God said that. He says, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. It needs a reset. When Noah, it says in the, in the, in the day of Noah, he says, every man that was right in his own eyesight. I see that now. You know, every man did what was right in his own eyesight. Not what God thought. Who cares about what God thought? We think, God, oh, I'm going bring that religion to my face. I'm going to do what I want to do. In the days of Noah, it says, every man it was right in their own eyesight, and they every, watch this, not action, because the actions follow up. Their every thought, every thought was evil. Every thought was evil. Chaos. Reset. <laughs> Reset. Noah, <laughs> build me an ark. <laughs> you know, and everybody who gets on this ark will be saved. The ark is another form of Jesus. Jesus says, I will go. He went and built a body. 
He used Mary, the virgin's body, to build another ark. That's why he comes out and says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life saver. Not the candy, a real life saver, okay? <laughs> so he said, he said, I am the light, right? Now, what was the ark? Remember, the ark had one door, one way in. You know, and everybody who got on the ark was what? Redeemed, saved, safe. <laughs> Guess what? Far from the tribulation. Far from the tribulation. God raised them up and the tribulation was pounding. Just like God says, I'm going to have you in the world, but not the other. You can be all around it, but it won't come near you. No hair will touch your head. It did the ark. Everything around us calamity falling apart, but not with the guys who have got in the boat. So Jesus has required you to come get in his boat. He is your ark. He's the one that's going to rise you above tribulation on a great reset. He resets your life, and he reset the earth, and he set the path already for us. Now watch this. What's the next thing? Confusion. We always say what? God says, I'm not the author of confusion. He just leaves it open. Then after that, he says, but if I'm not the author, well, who is? <laughs> you know? he, he never says the other guy. We just, by revelation, we get it. If God says, that, no, I'm not the author of confusion. If there's any confusion going on in your life, trust me, I have zero part of that. I have, that's all he just put, I'm going to put that out there like that. That's the way the word reads. He says, I'm not the author of confusion. If you have confusion in your life, you need to be reset. And you need to reset. And God, and, and that's another reason that things need to be reset. Disorder. Out of order. Oh my goodness. <laughs> World, do we have things out of order? We talked about earlier about the priority, how he says, um, and C.S. Lewis, he says, I'm going to have the people more dependent on God and not the things and resources. I'm going to bring the family back together and have dinner at the table. It's out of order. We never see our family. Time is the most precious thing. Time is flowing by, and we got so busy trying to do the life that we want to make for each other instead of the life that God has already prepared for us. I know the plans that I have for you. I know the life that I have for you. Jesus is the way, the truth, and what? Don't forget the other part. The life. What life? For each one of you guys and you on Facebook, God has already got a life plan out for you. And he tell you to prosper you, to be in good health, you know, that's full of joy and peace. Not stress. The one that you run off to, I'm going to work to stress myself out. I'm going to work with the boss, hate my guts. No, you go to work, but God says, I got a better life for you. You're still going to go and do those things. But watch this. You're going to do it with me. For without me, you won't be able to do it. <laughs> because now you're talking the fruit of the Spirit. Everybody loves fruit. They see fruit on a tree, everybody will go pick that fruit. They want to hang around it. They want to say, oh, look how pretty fruit fruit is. Everybody loves fruit. All right? But you got to bear it. God says, you can't bear this fruit without me. And that's what we messed up, because we'll use the gifts of the Spirit and not let the fruit of the Spirit carry. It has to go hand in hand with it. Well, nobody wants to nobody wants to be bothered with it. Because we don't have no fruit of the Spirit. That's why people are like, hey, they, they call themselves a Christian and all that why. They see no fruit. You know? And, and 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 the technology, yeah, they ain't mine. Yeah, they are a Christian. But they're a Christian without fruit. They might be gifted and talented, but it only gets you so far. When the world gets done, you're tired, you have a gift and talent, then somebody will come behind you, you have another gift and talent, they're gonna shock you. <laughs> done. Next. <laughs> Anybody else can tell me next? <laughs> next. But who they won't throw away too quick when they bring both of them. Somebody who everybody just loves. Draws crowds. Everybody wants to be in their, in their presence. They ain't going to throw you away too much. You are a precious commodity. You have the gift and the fruit. This is why you want to stay connected to God. This is why God got onto those guys and says, Away from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. But then we use our gifts to cast out demons, blah, blah, blah. You see, you never say they didn't. You use your gifts. But you never can't get connected to the Bible. We can build this relationship. That's a dangerous thing. And I used to always wonder, like, man, how can people be so anointed? Me included. And not act right. Don't treat my wife right, my kids right. I can't do that. I have to get back on the grind. You know, and you can do it. And that's a trap. It's a trap. Just like Star Wars. It's a trap. <laughs> Don't fall for that. You know, nobody cares about what you know. 
They go like, are you loving? Are you kind? Are you gentle? Do people want to be around you? You know, some people tolerate you. You have this rare gift. They are tolerate, but they're going to fool with you very long. Yeah, here, give them what they're doing. Get rid of them. You know, <laughs> they can hang around you. That's not how Jesus was. Jesus had all kinds of people. He got out to the people who were bad and resistant as king of darkness. Anytime you seen dark, you're about to get rebuked. And that's what you do with darkness. Rebuke your darkness. But anybody else, all you who have been laid, come to me. I'll give you rest. Even little kids. Because he told us the fruit and the gifts. That's what we got to work on. It's called the walk. Everybody believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. You do believe. But you're not walking with it. And I want to teach us how to walk the walk, because I was never taught how to walk. Though. I believe, really believe in God a lot, but nobody really taught me how to walk. I had to do the rough side of the mountain, as they say, and learn how to walk with God. Because nobody ever preached to me, told me how to walk with God. How do you walk with God? You know, I'm like, I believe in God. And I do my best, and you know, I know some things God like, and some things he's just going to have to understand, because I ain't, I ain't got that done yet, you know? That's your attitude. That's not a walk. The walk stuff is a second calling. God says, now that you accepted me, if you come after me, I want you to pick up your own cross. You're going to need that. Why? Because that's the fruit bearing stick. <laughs> you know, you'll get that piece of pine or whatever. That's going to help you produce fruit. You pick up your cross. And don't forget this follower. He says, now, follow me. Follow me. You have to melt on it. Follow me. You know what we do? Believe in me. Believe in me. And we confuse it with the follow me. Follow me. And then be like, I'm a Christian too, just like you. It don't take you because you're a Christian. You know, you do that. I don't do all that stuff you do, but I'm a Christian. You believe in thief on the cross. That's the level you are. You don't get the experience. If thief on the cross did not get the experience, the power and resurrection power that the disciples did because they followed Christ. They followed Christ. You never get that experience. You have to walk with God. And they're going to, just like you've seen some of the movies, like Chosen, you need to watch that. The chosen? Yeah, hey, where are we going? And they'll go, shh, we're going wherever we say we go. You know, when are we going to stop to get something to eat? Shh. When you say we're going to get something to eat, this is why it's hard for people to follow God. Why? You, a grown man, you a, a person, whoever, a lady, you used to doing your own thing. Your flesh is used to being in control. You know, so. You have to believe in God, but God's going to tell you, gag others, do this, say this, you ain't going to want to do it. Here's the thing about us. I can tell my flesh. It's funny. God's going to challenge you. The things that I think God should have me doing, you know, he don't want me to do. And then the things I don't want to do, he going to fuck my head to me. He goes, I don't want to do that. See? <laughs> and he knows my thoughts before all, so he makes me do it anyway. I'm like, I don't want to do that. Why don't you just let me do this? I mean, I'm good. Exactly. I want to appease. I want, watch this, I want to be in control. And that's what the cross is for. If any man come after me, that after me is not to follow after me. You already said, because don't get that confused with following after Christ and being in Christ because you believed upon his name, just like the believer thing. You're in him. But now you got to follow him. That's the second calling, and everybody doesn't do that. So God wants you to learn to follow after him. Now watch this. Confusion, disorder. God's not the author of confusion. I did confusion right I did it twice, huh? Because it's, it's really confusion. <laughs> I'm confused why I got two confusions up there, but hey, you don't want to be confused. Things are not just right. Things are not right. That's another way that God will reset things. Things are not right. Things are not right. In this world, a lot of things not right in this world. And God said, Now, while I'm talking about this, in the back of my mind, I know somebody's out there thinking, So, what are you, are you saying, like, God caused COVID 19 coronavirus? No, absolutely not. What is first thing I tell people I teach about what's the purpose? What is coronavirus doing? Is it killing? Is it stealing? And is it destroying? That's the definition of Satan. Satan comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But God comes and you might have life and have more abundance. So in the context that I'm saying this to you right now, I'm talking about the reset. God lives in eternity. He's seen some pandemic or plandemic 
happening. So he says, there'll be an opportune time for me to get the reset. Just like in the days of Noah. He knew. He said, no, okay, that's going to be the time for me to hit the reset button. Did he cause it? No. No. He caused the flood because he wanted to reset the earth. But he didn't cause people to start acting all evil, their own thoughts and their own eyes. Satan did that. It's always Satan. Kill, steal, and destroy. Men thinking only their only thoughts? Not one. Not one. You see later on, we get to the scripture where it talks about the twin cities of Solomon and Gomorrah. God says, if I can find just ten righteous people, I will spare. Can you imagine that? That God came to Phoenix and he could not find ten righteous people. <laughs> This is a twin city now. Two dual cities side by side. <laughs> you know, like Fort Worth and Dallas. You go between those, you can tell one murder to another sometimes. But not ten righteous people. So you're almost back to like in the days of Noah. You know, he says, I can't. They only thought. Well, just like, he just said they think evil. He says, they only thought of evil things. You know, and I'm like, wow. That's why it says, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? I said, man, that's something you don't want to play around with. This is why you stay in the Word, because your only true measurement is where am I at and why am I doing is by the Word of God. Anything outside that city is going to take you on a rabbit trail, and you're going to be so deceived, and you're going to get far, as they say, from the peaceful shore, using that analogy, like you just fell off in the water, but you thought you was right there by the shore, but you have drifted so far that you don't even know that you're far from the peaceful shores that God has set up for you. You're in the middle of this water, and you did not know it. Until one day you wake up, oh my God, I can't even see the shore anymore. That's how far. The, the way you do that is get away from the Word. You can't do it when you do the church that God said, uh, daily bread. You know, daily prayer. Watch and pray when you go. All these instructions are designed to make sure you never get in that position. All right? But you got to have some Word. What is your measurement? You can't say, I'm good. How do you know you're good? You know, well, how are you measuring that? And Lord knows it's just coming from you. You're done. <laughs> your, your heart's deceitfully wicked. It will tell you that. It will tell you that. You good, you. You ain't perfect, but you know, you ain't that bad either. You know how we used to say before you, I came to God? Well, I ain't robbing nobody. I ain't stealing nobody in the head. You know, you just put your little chest up. Brother, you need to get saved. <laughs> you need God. You need two Duncans. <laughs> I ain't talking about donuts either. You need to get dunked in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. You know, I'm serious. You, this deceitfully wicked, you do not do not let your heart deceive you. It will do it. Stay on the word. That's the only thing we have to know that we're good. So you need people to be our arrogant. I, I, I got patience for him. Like, I remember that. I remember I was that silly. I'm good, man. I didn't do that God thing, man. But you know, I'm good. No, you're not. Satan is having a field day with you. And the only thing I can do is pray and tell you the good news about you. That man, Jesus loves you. And Jesus already got a life for you. A life way better than the one you think you're creating for you right now. I'm telling you. Uh, I say, but hey, I'm here for you. I love you. And remember, uh, uh, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> and keep it moving. You have to. And you might be the one who planted the seed. You might be the one who watered. Or you might be the one who received the harvest. Nobody skips the process. I'm trying to teach you guys that before you won't start beating yourself up. Because you're going you to give your best act. I give them my best stuff, and they still, oh my goodness. Don't forget the rules. I tell you all the time. You have to be one, have to plant, one, have to water, one's going to reap the harvest. Watch this. In a mile for two or three witnesses, it will be established. See, I got all this stuff running in the back of my mind when I'm dealing with humans. Because if I don't, I'm going to lose my fruit. <laughs> you, know, you know, like, I'm just helping with you. You know, you're going to have the patience for them. But you got to realize, like, I don't know what stage I was just walking in. I can't see inside your brain. I don't know what's in your heart. Only the Holy Spirit knows what's in you. All I know is that God's prompted me to say something. And I just do that. It's about the function of your heart. But when it comes to that, don't forget. Don't get all mad when somebody's like, oh, yeah, that's cool, man. Have a nice day. You know, have a you nice know, day. They walk away like you never said anything. No. The word is what? Sharper than a double-edged sword. Make sure you speak the word. If you start speaking foolish, they won't penetrate. Speak the word. It's sharper than the double edged sword, able to penetrate the bone down to the bone marrow. You heard something. Words do that. Word has power. And watch this. What's the purpose of the reset? AKA, 
a new start, new creation in Christ. This is one thing I love. You need these right here. You know God forgave your sins, but sometimes you have a hard time. You doing it, God said, I forgave you. And you talk to people, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. And you talk to them, and you're like, yeah, but I just feel, not thinking, I feel. Well, you see, he erased the memories and the events and the errors. That reset that God did for humanity, that's what he does. The guilt of your shame. You can be almost like somebody speaking with being in prison. I murdered somebody. You think God forgives somebody like God? He already forgave you, bro. Because you know, now you're going to get that guilt and shame off of you because you have a memory. And God wants to create to erase those memories. The Apostle Paul, who wrote three quarters of the Bible, who used to go around throwing Christians in jail and persecuting Christians, when he said this statement, I laughed at him. I wanted to call him a liar. You're a liar. He's like, I have wronged no man. Dude, you throw thousands of Christians in jail. <laughs> you know, I'm in prison. You know, because you didn't like the way they was talking and hanging around Jesus. And you threw him in jail. And Paul stole boldly because he got a hold to the revelation of what God had done for him. I have wronged no man. Only God can do that. I mean, you can fake it. You know, people do that. I'm good. And they go home and start drinking alcohol because what you're doing, those drugs are for to get the pain. Jesus has already taken the pain. He already took it. That's what that reset is all about in your life. Other reason why we get a reset. Another reason to restore all things. God is the only one who can go and restore relationships of another human. Nations, families, individuals. The power of God can do that. Restore all things. God said, I restore. I make all things brand new. I make all things brand new. Watch this. But watch how he does it. He says, but in my own season. <laughs> you like, I want to do it now. And like God said, no, I'm going to do it. But it's going to be in my time. Because I got some other things I'm working out behind the scenes that you don't know nothing about. So, But you have blessed assurance that it's going to happen. To restore order back in your life. Order. In the kingdom of God, order is number one. That's the first thing God does, is put things back in order. Matter of fact, when he came to the earth, and he says, he, well, we say we remade the earth when he first made it, but as a remake, he says, because no God don't make anything dark, he says, and the earth was formless and void and dark. We know God don't make nothing like that. In him, he says, I am light, and in me there is no darkness. Satan had got a hold of the planet and made it dark. And God came and do. Hey, watch this. Another reset. <laughs> and when he reset, what's he going to do? He's going to correct errors and events that happen. He's going to restore all things. Didn't he do that? He restored all things, didn't he? He says, let there be light. And he started the firmament. You know, and when you read the Bible, like, just pay attention to the firmament. You know what the firmament is? That means the stars are on the ground. <laughs> and the waters, he said, he separated the waters from the water. You know, because when you have levels of water, water in the atmosphere, with the clouds, when you see a cloud, that's moisture, that's water. He separated the water from the water. He put the heavy, dense water back where it belonged in the ocean, and he took the other water and said, the moisture belongs up there. He separated the waters from the waters. But the ferment on the ground, the stars, you know, what happened here? <laughs> you know, you pull up on the scene, you got the stars, the moon, all hanging low here. Uh, where were you when I slung this moon in the sky? Where were you when I slung the stars back? He's talking to Job. Who are you judging me? No, you don't know. I did all these things, but God restores. That was another reset. God have what you could say is like, because we know God is sovereign to the point of his word. Then God turned everything on. He says, I have set my name, you know, my word above my name. So that's the sovereignty of God that we recognize. And most people get mad about you because they God, well, God, you know, God can do anything he wants. Because they want to put God in total control. That put God in control of what? COVID-19, deaths of little babies, babies born be cancers. And what he says, well, that goes against God. That's killing and stealing and destroying something, isn't it? God says, I don't do that. So therefore, God says, no, I have said my word. I am sovereign over my word. I said, let men have dominion over the earth. So men have dominion over the earth. All right? But God has this. God has set up for my own self these things called times, cycles, and seasons. Times, cycles, and seasons. That is his way in. All the other time, 
He does nothing unless he uses his prophets or proclaimers throughout his word. Who uses his word, because he remember he gives himself to his word. When you speak the word by faith, he makes sure that this word come to pass upon the earth. Oh, I wish I could say it to you like that again. That's exactly how things happen. When you learn that you're in a systematic lifestyle, everything becomes a lot easier. Organize the principles. Like I told you, how do you get saved? You have to accept Jesus. What's the process of the person's heart, the ground of their heart? You know, well, you're going to might be the process of a water. You're going to plant a seed. Why do you think, my sis, why do you think God is telling you about a gardener? Tell you you're a gardener? He's going to tell you that you're a soldier? Or you're an athlete? All these are very progressive guys who produce fruit in their life, product in their life. He told Adam, be fruitful, multiply. All right? Guess what? When you the word, he told, he says his word, the word is the seed. It comes in three things. It, it carries everything it needs to grow. We need for a seed to grow. You need water. First you need a seed, seed, water, and light. He calls that of the word of God all the time. Guess where we guess where we put that at? You take this book of seed, which is a seed, water, and light. And what is your body made of? Dirt. <laughs> Dirt. <laughs> when you plant that seed of righteousness in somebody, or any other seed of the word in somebody, it will produce. This is why Satan fights you. If you spit this word of God in you by faith, put the armor on, he got to get you to dig it up. Get that out of them right now. If that produces, they could be a terror for my, my kingdom of darkness. This is why Satan fights you so much. That's why it's called a good fight of faith. The only fight you have is the fight of faith. And your job is to keep that seed that work now. That ain't right because God says this. No, you get these thoughts. You get bombarded in your brain. That ain't right because the word of God says this. That's why the psalm says, I hide the word in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you don't have the word to pull up to come beat the thoughts that he's giving you, you will lose the battle. And the word that you did know, you will eject it out. And then you get this illusion with God and say, girl, I can't believe it. I believe in this. But you get rid of the word. You only get rid of this way, though. You can't go behind and say, I believe God this. And later on, well, you know, I, I really don't believe that. Well, if you don't believe that, you, you have nothing, you just uprooted it. You can't say it. The psalm says this, I set a God with my mouth. Why? I don't want to get rid of my seed. Can you imagine a farmer spent all day out in the field, throwing seed and stuff like that, and he goes out and they get mad. Why do you think they got what you call a scare crow out there? Not only just for the crop that rises up, but the seed that's in the ground. You get animals out there digging up and eating the seed. Well, that's what Satan does. He's your animal, digging up your seed by giving you a crazy thought, and he wants to go. And if he put a thought on you, it puts pressure on that red thing in your mouth that creates life and death. He wants you to say something that will root that seed that you have in you. I'm telling you, when you learn the system of the kingdom of God, you're a walking bag of seed. I mean, you told a walking bag of seed right here, and you hide this word in your heart, and you can produce whatever life that you want. You want peace? in there. You want joy? It's in there. You want prosperity? It's in there. Husband, wife? It's in there. It's like a word, though. It's in there. <laughs> it's in there. It's, you have to learn the system, though. It's called the kingdom of God operation. And God tells you, say, now, to a person who's not saved, he says, to this, this is great foolishness that this guy is talking to you right now. But to us, it's the gospel that produces power for life. Our whole life is ran this way. It's a seed. God says in, in, in Genesis 8, he says, as long as the earth remains in seed, time, and harvest, winter, cold, summer, hot, he said they will all exist. As long as that blue marble is spinning on the axis, you are always going to have that going on. But what do we do about global warming? Uh, like I said, as long as the earth remains, <laughs> you know, whose word are you going to relieve? We shall relieve the report of the Lord, not the report of fake news. That stuff is fear tactic. You know, God already knows. This is God's word. God says, the earth is mine. You think I don't know? I live in eternity. They live in time. You don't think I know what's going to go on? He just told you in Ecclesiastes, I already know what's going on. Why? Because I'm going to make it happen. The same thing once before will be again. So that's why he's going to promise you in Genesis, it's like, hey, as long as the earth remains, 
I was going to be some winter somewhere, some summer somewhere, <laughs> some days, some night. You say, hey, uh, it's, it's my earth, you know? And you know why? And please ask why. Because I'm going to make it happen. So now, God can, yes, God, he created it. Now watch this. This is a story of a prophet called Haggai. Now we're talking about prosperity, because a lot of people are going back to work, and they're really concerned about how I'm going to make a living. You know, well, last week, I mean, not last week, the week before last, I talked about God showed you his plan called the kingdom of God. He says, if you just seek the kingdom of God, which is his way of doing and being right in his kingdom uh, and his righteousness, uh, he says all things will be added. All those things that you go and chase, uh, your needs, and I show you the tree that it says uh, philosophical, that we need, uh, man needs water, food, air, and all So God says, look at the birds. They start giving you examples. Look at the birds. They don't go around worrying about COVID. <laughs> no, they don't worry about what they're going to eat. You know, now, people say, he says, I, I, I provide worms for the birds. Now, I'm a practical teacher, so therefore, let's take a look at that. I don't just read the story. Yeah, God provides worms. So that, does that mean do I stay home and the job's going to fall in my lap without me filling out the resume? Even the bird leaves the nest <laughs> and put that beak in the ground <laughs> to get that worm that God has provided. Everything has faith without works is what they So therefore, Haggai 2 and 6 says this. Let's go to that. It's a prophet. He's talking about, he says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth. The sea and dry ground. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with my glory, says the Lord Almighty. He's talking about he's going to fill the house of the Lord. Oh, glory. He says, I'm going to shake the nations up. This happened before. Why? We read the scriptures. Well, once before, we'll be again. So nothing to shock in God. I will shake the nations, and what is desired of those nations will come, and I will fill the house with my glory. Right? Verse 8 says this. Here's what you understand. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the God Almighty. God knows when he shakes something that economics are always affected by it. Then he, re then he reassures his people, like, don't, don't get it twisted. All the silver and the gold is mine. Basically, God said all economic monies all over the nations, he said, that's mine. You know, so God, can, as a king, the king can do what he wants. He gives who he wants to give, and he takes away. That's what those perils are about. He says, take from his unjust ruler, I mean, his unjust servant right here, and you give it here. That's what kings do. The king says, I want to hear the lands of the Far East. I fought as a king. So you don't have to worry about God's line on your knee. He says, I'm going to give you according to what you can handle. You can determine what you can handle by the way you manage. Then you see, that's how he determined when he first started, he said, okay, you get three, you get two, you get one. And then he came back and said, now I'm going to measure that. Great job. Give him more. Okay, high five, brother. Good job. <laughs> you know, what, what do you do? Well, I know he was unjust. And so I took my money, I just hid. You didn't multiply? You didn't do this? And he goes this, uh, um, this whole line of reasons what he could have did with it. You could have put these players in the bank and draw some interest on it. You could have did this with it. And he just let them know, like, you're a bad servant. Take from him and give it to him. Faithfulness. This is how you determine what you can handle. Are you a good steward? Are you a good steward? You have to be a good steward in all areas of your life. And whatever you're a good steward in your life, I guarantee you have a, a, a good supply. And whatever area of your life you're not a good steward of, it will relieve you. It will subtract. Why? You gotta understand how the kingdom works. God is sitting down on the throne. He's not sitting there looking at any other thing. He already knows. Remember, he's God like that. I showed you in from the beginning. So he already seen everything going to happen. He already did his work. When he said he's rest, he's finished. He's seen everything work. He sits down. He says, every life, every person I've ever going to put down on the planet, everyone's going to be born, every, every hookup, every tragedy, he already seen it. He sits there and look at it, and he hits start. And all he did was put spiritual laws in place. And the spiritual laws govern your life. They're governing your life. You run to a man once in a while and realize, and he'll just give you insight. He'll give you what? Inside trader. Why? Because you never knew the kingdom of God or God before. He'll give you inside trader information. He says, hey, when you give, 
it shall be given. You know, good measure, press back, it will come back and run it over to you. Why? Because he's going to, I'm going to wave a wand. Angel, I seen them give. They dropped five dollars in the pot. Go give them. You know. Spiritual law is already in place. That's why he said, and whosoever. See? Like gravity. Whosoever jump off the building. They're not going to float in the air. They're going down. Whosoever. <laughs> All right? So these laws are like natural laws. They have spiritual laws in there. This is what Jesus was telling the disciples. says, you have the kingdom. It's God's pleasure to give the kingdom. And guess what? I'm going to give you keys of the kingdom. In other words, I'm going to give you inside traders. But these spiritual laws are already working out there. You'll see some people in the world, they'll catch on to some stuff. Since they don't have God in it, it's always half whack, and it's about maybe three quarters true. But they miss another side. We learn about the law of attraction. You ever heard of that? The law of attraction. Law of attraction, right? Books all on it. They tapped into it. We have our own version of this stuff in the Bible, but it's pure. And it's of God. You know, so the way they do it, they mess it up. They sing some people do this. The law of attraction. We just know this. You hang around positive energy, positive energy, all this kind of stuff. This is the laws that God gave his people. We got the inside trading. They accidentally fall into the custom. Matter of fact, he writes in the Bible says the people, the people of the world are profiting from the laws than some of the people who have a covenant with me. My people perish, what? For a lack of that type of knowledge. They don't know that there's spiritual laws out there that make it happen. Instead, they go up there and start whining and crying to daddy, wah, wah, and realizing like everything's in here. I have given you what? Everything that pertains to life. And godliness. These we made these the great suggestions, and these it has keys. It's like some of those games you play. You go play keys, and you like you get you go uh, uh, scavenge your hunt, and you find something that gives you more. Well, that's what it is. God said, "If you hunger and thirst for more righteousness, you shall be fulfilled." You can go in this Bible, and still you just reading the story. You can go find a principle hidden, which is a key hidden in the middle of the story that you can use for everything. I found the key. I found the key. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. And he was telling his, telling his disciples, I'm going to give you some keys. And then I'll let you discover some keys. Why? It keeps you fresh. It keeps you seeking after God. It keeps you dependent on God. He's not just going to give you it all front. He's going to have to call good works of faith. Verse 9 says this. So silver, silver and gold. Silver is what we call redemptive exchange. Redemptive change. You remember uh, Judas sold Jesus for what? 30 pieces of what? Silver. Gold is divine. This is why you get to the streets in heaven. It says the streets are covered with what? Gold. Because it's in heaven and it's divine. Gold represents royalty. But silver has a redemptive price. That's one of the keys when you read the scripture and you run the body and he had a silver this and a silver that. Sometimes you get into a, some allegories in the revelation. And it, it starts, they start specifically showing you that it's gold and he had a golden hat and had a silver. It's going to have a meaning. Just by knowing this meaning. Okay? Amen? Well, watch this. Verse 9. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares Oh Lord. So God is saying, look, nothing happens about me. You know what? The same thing happened once before, but happened again. Uh, uh, he says, uh, the glory that was once before would be greater than the one in the form of glory. We got that form of glory coming up. Praise God. Watch this. Uh, Hebrews 12 and 6. We're going to talk about shaking it. In Hebrew, now we're going to go to the New Testament. At this time, his voice shook the earth. What time was that when God's voice shook the earth? But he now, he has promised, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens next time. See, we haven't seen the heavens shake right now. There's coming a time that when God gets ready to shake, he can say, I'm going to shake the earth and the heavens. All right? The first time he's talking right here in this verse, it says, at that time, his voice shook the earth. Well, that happened at Mount Sinai. You remember God told him, hey, I want to meet with the people. Moses, get all the people, put their fine clothes on, they're going to meet with me. And he says, do not even let, he says, now I'm going to be over the mountain, he's over the mountain, and all these things, light and fire and molten, because God's like consuming fire. And the mountain itself was getting heated up. He says, now once once God touched something, or set aside something, this now is holy. That whole mountain was holy at the time. And any unclean thing cannot touch anything that is holy. All right? So therefore, he told 
do not even let the animals touch it. Anything that touches this mountain when I'm over it will die. All right? Because there could be no flesh exalted before God that's not pure. This is why we celebrate Jesus, because Jesus came and made us pure. It's called his righteousness. He made us right with God. He made us pure enough so we can have the presence of God in us. It was unholy vessels. He put a brand new gas tank in us, and he filled us with the Holy Spirit. Amen. He says, now you just keep filling that tank up. I put a tank in you. He says, I'm going to move that fleshly stomach heart out of there. Corrupted, dirty, unholy, and I'm going to put a heart of flesh back in you. And it's going to be pure. And in that heart, which God only deals with, the heart of man is the count of the Lord, is the only thing that God deals with. And he uses your heart to guide you throughout life. And that's where the Holy Spirit is around. Your spiritual heart, not the blood pump. Your spiritual heart, right? You're a spirit being, so you have a spiritual heart. Okay? So therefore, God says, do not let them even touch. That was the first thing. He said, but next time I get ready to shake it, it's going to be not only the earth, but the heavens. And that's when people are going to start, you know, and you talk, we get an eschatology study in times. You see people talking about certain things falling out the sky and all this kind of stuff. That's the study of eschatology. Uh, study of eschatology, I used to go deep into this stuff. I kind of slowed down. Uh, just to let you know, after chapter 3, we're not there. <laughs> We're in it. <laughs> Revelation. Revelation. And chapter 3 of your Revelation, the church is gone. All right? So after all the other stuff you start reading, it's going to be for you, the Jewish nation, and, uh, tribulation, and all the other stuff they're going through. Now, we want to teach that to let people say, hey, look, you don't want to be left down here for this stuff that's going to be going on. But we're out of here. You know, we we be being what? We're going to be snatched away. People like the word rapture. The word rapture's not in there. Okay, I'm fine. A uh, quick snatching out of there. Like your kid about to fall, you quickly snatch him up. <laughs> well, will you snatch up? You know, it says uh, Enoch was translated. You use, we're going to be translated. Okay? Plenty of examples of you being translated. Are you being, uh, are the whole purpose of tribulation, or the great tribulation, is judgment on earth. But we already been judged at the cross. And Jesus took the whipping post, that was about healing. But the cross was all the judgment he took on for you and I who believe in Hallelujah. So we can have peace. But Noah's Ark is a real quick version of it. You want to teach your kid how to do it. Like, what do you mean, Mary? Do you remember when uh, the earth was being covered with water? The people on the boat were safe. They rose above all that calamity. And when the calamity is over, they came back down to the earth because God's word says, let man have dominion over the earth. Not heaven. I know people that I got mansions that you might have a big one. You ain't going to be there very long because you're supposed to have dominion over the earth. <laughs> and God says, well, here's, a, here's one verse you want to look up. God says that all the word of God has already been established in heaven. So this is why he don't argue. When people argue with the word, already done. It's already been established in heaven. You know, so he ain't got to worry about it. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm about to take a swig. So what's going on right now? With COVID, we got this thing called what? A global economic collapse. Global economic collapse. I had some numbers. I didn't come up here. Man, they were talking about uh, over uh, 30 million people in six weeks have filed for unemployment. 30 million people. And that was two or three weeks ago. They filed for an animal. I said, I'm a living witness. Some of y'all out there. I'm one of those. I'm 299. <laughs> hey, we with you. And, and this is why I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you on about this. God is not mad with you. God is for you. The whole point of me even talking about this is let you know that even if that system collapsed, God's system never collapsed. And I want you to learn his system. If you're a born again believer, you have the kingdom of God within you. You just got to get the keys and know how to operate in the system. God gave to you because he's seen this. He sees all things, knows all things, and he knew during time, cycles, and seasons, calamity, uh, destruction, confusion, and he's doing his part. He says, this is the time I'm just going to reset. I didn't cause it to happen, but I can turn it out for their good. This will be a good time for them to get back in the Word, good time to get back with the family, good time to turn off all that football that's not playing, and start worshiping God and not football and games. 
You know, so God turned around and made you good for good. I mean, think about Joseph. The story of Joseph was a guy who told his dream, I have a dream. And then the next thing you know, he said, I just told you what you told me to say, Lord. I feel that way. I just told you what you told me to say, and it ended up getting me in hot water. The next thing you know, he's hot water. What, what's the first thing? You're in hot water with your family. Why? You're talking all that God stuff. You're talking the word. You're talking the word from God. Who's going to get mad at you first? The people who are supposed to love you the most. <laughs> Why? They like you just the way you are. Not this new creature in Christ you that came up with. Because not because you're such a bad person, but you are walking conviction towards them. <laughs> that is why. You can't take it personal. Every time they see you, they're like, man, I need man, you're watching. And you're not being mean, you're not being crap, but it's just them knowing that you have a new born again spirit inside you. It's messing with their spirit. It's convicting them. So that's what I saying. So don't get mad. They took Job and they threw him in the pit. And then told his daddy that he got eaten by a lion. <laughs> you know? And he never seen him. That story is awesome. I'm showing you the story of Jesus. The first thing he went to his brothers and told them what? The word of God. <laughs> what happened? The people you're supposed to love and accept you the most, they reject you. And here's the worst thing we'll get in trouble. He said this, just like I say all the time. God is not just God. Watch this. He's my father. <laughs> I like saying it like that. He's my father. You know, it's different. People get mad. They're like, man, you're acting like that. Yeah, he's my father. When Jesus told the people who were supposed to love him the most that God was his father, and it says from that day forward, they plotted to see how they're going to kill him. Now, down here, they might not murder you, shoot you with a gun, but they're going to be murdering you with another. Here's the roll, holy roll. <laughs> you know, oh Lord, they'll start talking about the Bible. You know, <laughs> we don't want to hear that. See, they're going to murder you with their tongue. See, but that's what happens. So I'm just trying to, you know, pre warn you. God tell you to put an armor. Fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight. It's going to be a battle. You have to fight to keep your seed that you got. I'm believing God for a lot of stuff. I prayed with some people. I'm believing God deliver. I believe God will do things in my life. You got to fight for that. You got to fight to not just go out there and tell them and use your gift and not God actually produce the fruit in you. You know, this is some work. You know, this is the good work that we're supposed to do on the planet, which is our reasonable service. I'm talking fast. And thin. You know, I can roll, grind, this man. I can roll some arms here tonight. Get going. Revelation 6.6 6 talks about this. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, I measure a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And I see thou heard not, not the oil or the wine. He says, see that you don't touch the oil or wine. But here he's talking about a barley loaf, one penny. I'm talking about economic collapse. We've seen this stuff happen in um, what, South America. You remember when they had a big crash and these people was coming across the border because South America economy just boom, boom. I mean, people couldn't have nothing. Talking about toilet tissue, you know, the issues. They were just talking about they had nothing. The economy just would implode. And God's talking about you know, how that can happen in a day. We just seen the stock markets drop in a day. Why am I talking to you about this stuff? You was never supposed to depend on none of that. My hope and trust is in the Lord. All the Psalms contain David trying to tell you, girl, I got horses and chariots, I got gold, this and gold that, even Solomon telling you like that stuff means nothing. Solomon wrote you a book and told you meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Did I mention meaningless? <laughs> he said this stuff is vain, vanity, nothing. All this stuff that you are accumulating us means nothing. I got realized that years ago, like, wait a minute, everything that I was wanting and liking. Can you be going in the fire with one matchstick? Poof! Gone. That's why God says, don't live for your treasures down here on earth. Put your stuff in the spiritual realm where you have access to it when you need it. You're stewards. You're a steward. And you have to learn to say, you got to trust God. I trust God. My needs going to be met. All my needs going to be met all the time. Why? Because I trust in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways, I acknowledge him first, and he would direct my path. Revelation 13 says this. He calls all, both the small, great and rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. Now we're going to eschatology end time. We're talking about some stuff that's going to happen in the future. But what we get to see, like, we are actually seeing the setup for that right now. 
We not might be in the day, but we can see. We won't be shocked like, oh yeah, we can see it now. And with this big reset, you get to see it more plainly than ever. You already see, like, you thinking like, oh, they're gonna be taking people and they're gonna make them and they're gonna do them like they're doing cattle, silent and brand them. Six, six, six. No. It's gonna happen just like it happened when they say COVID's out there and people freaked out, they're gonna volunteer. Where's the vaccine? When you're gonna make it? When you gonna, they're gonna volunteer for it. They're gonna give it their own freedom. Because they're gonna be deceived. Because once you get fear, which they're pushing on you, and all they're going to show you records and statistics of somebody else died, another person died, somebody else in the ventilator, like right that. They ain't going to show you the numbers are wearing. Uh, we got over 2 million people recovered. <laughs> you know, in constant numbers. They ain't going to even mention that. That does not fit the fear, normally, that they're doing to you. And they're going to scare you so bad where when you're in fear, you can't think right. You don't think reasoning. You don't think logically. When you're in fear, all you want to do is get out of the fear. Because what we, I saw you the definition of fear was emotionally unstable, you know, you're not thinking. You know, he's constantly in that state, like the little animals you pick up, the little puppy when they first come out, they don't know you, and you pick them up, they, he's shaking. That's what fear does. It can keep you in that constant state. Now watch the next verse. It says, and, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark and the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now people get caught up in all this kind of stuff. I'm not teaching on eschatology tonight. Hey, they, then they got this stuff so wrong. God told you that nobody knows a lot of stuff. Some things he says, I'll give you a road map for you know the time and the season that you'll be in. That's about it. But mo most people do. They're always trying to predict when the law is coming. Error. Jesus already told you, I don't even know when I'm coming. And I'm coming. <laughs> you know what? He told him that. He said, I don't know when I'm coming. Only the Father. He said, that. I don't know. He said, the angels don't know. I don't know. I'm the one to be sent. But only the Father knows. No matter how you tell people that, you're going to find people get right away from there, and they're going to do their little agorism and all that kind of stuff. Make, make good bookseller. Get you all right. And it's sad because, you know, you look at the mercy of God because when you're a false prophet, it don't happen. You're supposed to get stoned to death. It don't happen anymore. That's why people can say anything. And then they revamp it. But another thing, you revamp it. We didn't have so many cults do that, and people take their lives. And all they had to do is what? What I tell you earlier? That would never happen. That exception never happened to you if you were. If you just what? Stick to what God has said and spoken in his word. The same thing when you get in a heavy fight with all kinds of rumors and rumors of stuff and theories, like you go and analyze with the word of God. Oh, matter of fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give some practical tonight with this. I did have some numbers, but I'm not gonna talk about it. <laughs> I can remember I got you some numbers anyway. I want to give you at least five things to do real quick. I'm going to run to you guys that. First of all, in this, in this, in this COVID thing, that's mad, I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> in this COVID thing, I want you to model faith to your children. During this reset, this is what you need. You need to model your faith. Sell it in your soul that God will pay your bills, protect your job, and restore what you have lost. Don't speak fear. Hallelujah. Or doubt in your home at all. The greatest lesson you will ever model for your children and the greatest gift you will ever leave them is to confess that everything has been, uh, everything that has been lost will be restored. Why? Because God does a re reset and what happens when he starts? Restoration. All right? So he's restoring things for you. Because when this is over and God comes through, as you know he will, they will remember and apply these lessons in their lives. And whenever they are threatened, they're going to say, I remember mom and dad, and they got in mind. They said this and this, this, and it happened. So, hey, when I get them all, I'm just going to do the same thing they did. This is a good time. Number one, model faith for your children. Do not speak fear of doubt. Everybody got that? The greatest thing your children can watch you do is trust in God. During this reset, during this COVID lockdown, quarantine, whatever state you're in, whatever level they went. Model. Number two, dump all the questionable prophetic words and conspiracy theories. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Some in the prophetic camp are losing credibility because they are falsely predicting this plague 
would leave suddenly. Some even said a day, one that will likely prove them wrong. In the Old Testament, such problems would have been stoned. I told you that earlier. It is this lack of consequence in the prophet account that has wreaked havoc and left many unprepared for the storm that is upon them. In other words, you don't want to mislead people. People who think won't be prepared because you tell them the wrong stuff. We want you prepared. I believe in army. I like information. So you don't make sure you don't get caught up in that. How much clearer can the Bible be? Isaiah 8, 12, 13 says, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy. You need to be afraid of their threats. See, they're going to tell me, yes, it's going to happen. Nor be troubled. The Lord of armies, him you shall hallow or worship. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. In other words, conspiracies, some people tell yourself just to even add more fear to your life. It says, let God be your fear. You fear the Lord. That's the only thing we fear. You know, so watch that stuff. Don't get caught. It's easy to get caught because, you know, there's a lot of unknowns and questions over our head about this stuff. Uh, continue number two. It says, it's all over the internet and the religious broadcasting. There is a worldwide secret society. It's the devil and his vessels. <laughs> And they say, Nancy Pelosi cooked this coronavirus up in Chinese laboratory. Could be or could not. We don't have no word for that. And I don't want you putting energy to it because we don't know. It could be. All right? And everything they're going to tell you is going to line up that way. But we're not going to put energy. Now, don't get me wrong. We're listening. But we're not going to. That's not our faith. Our faith is the word of God. You know, so that's why we can't get caught up in it. Stop Stop needing, needing, a, uh, needing a word from God. You already got 66 six books. That really burns me up. People, I need a word for God. <laughs> you got 66 six books of word. You need more? Have you done all you can to stand? You know? Praise God. From people, stop digging into controversy. In 2 Timothy 2 and 23, it says, Paul warned, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels or arguments. As soon as it's going to cause an argument, step away. No, it's a trap. Instead, watch this big one. Read your Bible. How about that? <laughs> Read your Bible. Now that you have a lot of time, get the Word of God in you. That is the most powerful protection and the best way to understand how the weather a storm. When you're in the storm, read your Word of God. That is your anchor. Number three, make a list of goals for this downtime. Work hard to meet those goals. Already you see how many things have stolen your time. You see how many things that previously cluttered your life seem unimportant now. Yes, because you are a child of God. Nothing of yours that is vital will be stolen. Your job, your business will be brought back to life. Therefore, choose to see this as a kind of paid vacation. Paid by God. Hallelujah. That's my one message. Life should be like a vacation every day anyway. When you enter to God's rest, that's what he's designed you. Yeah, you're working, but it's it's for this victory. But yeah, it's a paid vacation. So most of them, oh, 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 yeah. relax. You're on vacation. Chill. Hey, but God, God's gonna hook you up. You part of this kingdom. He's not gonna let you bake a bread. Inspiration will lead you to pray, but you must decide to form a habit that will keep you praying. People get inspired easily. They like inspirational preaching. But me, I like no. You need to form a habit. We're creatures of habit. Cre create a habit, friend. Watch this. Here's a practical way to do it. The chilling fact is that if you do not pray during this pandemic, you would never pray at all. If this thing gets you on your knees, hello, walls. <laughs> you know, you after they release this, you probably won't. You would never pray at all. Let God deliver you from the great greatest hindrances to pray that I know of. Impulse praying and feeling base praying. Meaning, okay, I just pray because I feel like it. Or impulse meaning something tragic is happening. No, now I'm on one. I need to pray. Habitual pray. Pray always without ceasing. Create a habit. How do you do that? Right now, forget about how long you pray. See? Focus on praying each and every day. That's going to be your goal. Every day I'm going to pray. All right? We'll get that down. Next thing, behaviors have shown that it takes doing sometimes 35 times in a row before it becomes a habit. If you create that habit and deepen the habit, you will own your own life. Uh, you, will deepen, you will own life's greatest skills. James 5.16 says this, Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. 
And we praying for each one because we here. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man is building much. And this is why it's making it so important. And number five. Number five. <laughs> Focus on personal repentance, not national repentance. Focus on personal repentance, not national repentance. If everybody judged their self in the nation, then the whole nation would have judged themselves. <laughs> right? <laughs> so you do it. <laughs> we always say that you do it. When Jesus told the people five fishes, you do it. Don't wait for others or even think about other people's repentance. People have been Babbling about national repentance as if it was something other people need to do. <laughs> yeah, they need to repent. Yeah, 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 we need to repent. We don't see national repentance happening yet, so don't wait for it to happen. Repent on your own. A lot of people all I do is they wait, and I can't wait to open the gate. I'm out of here. Personal repentance again. We do not even see widespread repentance among the preachers. No one. Have you heard many preachers on social media admit they, they're being wrong? I ain't have to change my message. I ain't bragging, but I ain't, I ain't have to change my message. I've been preaching the same thing over and over again. Amen. Amen to old me. <laughs> we are flooded with messages from preachers, but I haven't. Have you heard one major pastor or preacher repent or promise that they will run church differently than they did before? Do you see any preacher who isn't just jumping at the bed to restart the same old thing? I promise you, unless a deep repentance takes place, you will be shocked at how unchanged the American church will be after all this. Think about this. How much really has changed after 9-11? We had this before in America. 9-11 hit. They turned off the sports and they turned off night talk shows. That's real serious when those two go out because they are big gods in America. Night shows and sports, and they shut them down for almost three weeks in a morning period. And that was the opportunity. A lot of people ran the church. They can't run the church now because they closed that church, and we're not essential. Really, another topic. But, anyways, we must repent. It's something we got to do different. We can't go by and say, oh, I can't wait to open, and we're going to go back to doing the same thing. I'm not just talking about the preacher, I'm talking about your individual life. Because I say, if we all do it as an individual, then the whole church, because we are the church, would re repent it, right? So I'm just getting that out there, like, look, me included, I'm not excluding myself, but we're going to have to do, instead of trying to wait for the world to repent, we're going to do it. You do it, all right? One more before we go. Remember God's judgment in America as much, as much because of the world as because of the church. See? God says, also, see, people think he judged the world. Like, no, this is just what's up on the church. How are you going to sit there in a world crisis and they say we're not essential? That's embarrassing. I don't like it, never will be, and you can't tell me that. No. Because why? First of all, when it comes to God, when God looks at the blue model, he only looks at the church to change the blue model. They didn't even access to the meeting, which is wrong. But it's our fault. We were essential because we went acting on essential before the crisis. That's our fault. That's one of the things we need to repent about. You want to be called to a meeting? It's time for us to repent. And so making ourselves more important in the community and in government. Get involved in the government. Don't complain about the government. Complain about everybody else. You get involved. You do. And watch this. Carnal Church has left us open to this disaster. And yet, without repentance, we have zero reason to believe it won't go back to exactly the way it was before. Key words. Not being negative. If we don't repent, as soon as they open the doors back, we're going to go back to our same way of living life. It's like it'd be wasted. That's a waste of time. All right? Well, watch this. Without repentance, we go back the same way. Zero reason to believe it. Won't go back to be exactly the way it was before. In other words, they will have learned nothing from the pandemic or the pandemic. <laughs> Amen? Second Chronicles, with this prayer, we're going to leave this. Second Chronicles 17 should know. If my people who call by my name will humble themselves and pray, Seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin, their sin, and then I will heal their land. See, we need to repent of our own personal sin. And right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this word that came forth. We ask you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit go and use the other C word, not condemn, but conviction. That we sit down and convict the world, the system of sin. Also, Lord, that we are convicted in the sins that we need to do, Lord. That we confess our sins one to another, Lord, that we might be healed 
in every aspect of my life. And right now, if you're out there right now and you have not accepted Jesus into your heart, I'm going to give you an opportunity to become a God's kingdom. The way you can operate in a whole different system. But God says you only have to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything that you're out there chasing will be added to you. Peace, joy, prosperity, provision will be added right now. Everybody pray me and say, uh, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you, you came down here and you died for my sins on the cross. That you nailed every sin that I ever done, will do. Past, present, and future. And Father, right now, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Lord, that I want to follow you now, as you told the disciples. I want to follow follow you. I want to follow you, Lord. How do I follow you, Lord? I want to follow you in your word. I want to do everything that you say in your word that I should be doing. Right now, I believe that you died, you rose again on the third day, and now I receive you in my heart. And from this day forward, I not only live for me, but I live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Give God the hand clap. Well, we love you. See you next week. God is good. Amen.